Here, off the northwest coast of Australia, on the edge of the continental shelf, lies Woodside's most ambitious project to date. It's the Browse Joint Venture, and it could soon become the next northwest shelf. The Browse Basin includes three giant gas fields discovered by Woodside. The largest, Tarosa, is crowned by Scott Reef, two coral atolls rising sharply from the seafloor and stretching out over a third of the gas field below. Coral reefs like this one are some of the most complex ecosystems on the planet and not the easiest of places for carrying out the extensive seismic surveys needed to map out a new gas reservoir. We're dealing with a, a coral reef habitat that probably has 30,000 different species on it. Scott Reef is the largest coral reef in Western Australia, an offshore coral reef. We were very aware that we needed to have some good data to be able to show both within the company and stakeholders and regulators that we weren't having an impact when it came to seismic. How then would Woodside be able to realise the potential of one of the largest gas finds while still preserving one of the world's most sensitive habitats? The answer lay with science. Woodside and its Browse joint venture partners had to determine whether their seismic surveys would damage the coral reef and its inhabitants. No conclusive research existed anywhere in the world, but without the benefit of seismic, Browse's true potential could not be realised. Seismic surveys use sound waves to produce a picture of the rock layers beneath the Earth's surface. Air guns discharge a bubble of compressed air which sends a sound wave through the water and into the Earth's crust. The sound waves are then reflected from layers of rock beneath the sea floor. These faint echoes are detected by underwater microphones, towed behind the survey vessel in streamers several kilometres long. The returning sound waves help geologists build a model of where the gas body lies within the rock layers and how big it is. In all, the Maxima 3D seismic survey would survey an area of some 340 square kilometres, from the shallows at 20 metres to waters more than 1,000 metres deep. A seismic survey is the very first step in that really. Is it's like an ultrasound of the earth trying to look at a very hazy picture of what the geology might be like. But what happens to a fish that encounters seismic sound? Bigger, highly mobile fish who live in deep open water can swim away, but the smaller fish, dependent on the reef for food and shelter, are mostly sight attached. Some never move more than a few metres from their habitat in a lifetime. How then would they react when the air guns discharged? And would the intensity of the seismic sound wave travelling through the water damage their hearing? Woodside, together with its Browse partners, committed 10 million Australian dollars and gathered a team of local and international marine experts to carry out a daunting piece of research that had never been attempted on this scale before. It would hope be the biggest experiment of this type in a coral reef system that's been done systematically in the world, I would say. You start just with the concept of trying to catch fish, uh, and fish obviously don't always like to be caught, and we're not talking about catching nice large snappers and so on, we're talking about um, small tropical reef fishes. So there's certainly a lot of trial and error involved in trying to work out how to catch fish and then keep them alive, because we, the whole objective of this was to prove that we're not going to impact on them. So how do fish hear, and how sensitive is their hearing? Fish have ears, not like ours, but ears completely inside their head. Their auditory system contains a specialised structure called an otolith. It's made of hard calcium carbonate that also provides a sense of balance to fish in much the same way the inner ear provides balance in humans. On the otolith is a membrane covered in fine hair cells that bend when they're stimulated by the movement of sound underwater. The movement of those hairs sends a nervous response to the brain, and that's what's interpreted as sound by the fish. What the scientists wanted to determine was what no one in the world knew for certain. Would seismic sound affect the hearing of fish on the reef? And if it did, would it be temporarily or permanently damaged? Industry and researchers had been discussing this for years, but now the Browse LNG development needed to know beyond doubt. 
What we were looking for was damage to these uh, hair cells and we can only look for gross damage where they've been ripped out or, or removed or fish can actually regrow their hair cells. So we were looking for evidence where these things have been pushed out and new ones were growing. This technique of trying to determine if, whether a fish has gone deaf or not, usually what happens is that someone cuts a fish up after it's been exposed and months later you'll find out whether the, the cells on the hearing organ have, have died or not. Obviously we couldn't wait those long periods of time and we had to conduct this uh, research over the period of three weeks. So we had to do the testing of he fish hearing live in the field and it had never been done anywhere in the world before. The research team faced what first appeared to be insurmountable obstacles. To begin with, they had to collect data over an area of 400 square kilometres and all of it underwater. They would be 22 hours steam from Broome with 120 scientists and crew all needing food and a place to sleep, let alone enough room to work. They needed to catch hundreds and hundreds of reef fish, but they had to be alive, tested and released back to the reef as quickly as possible. We had to prepare 23 cages, we had to prepare cameras for the cages, we had to build a specialised tube to put fish in to measure their hearing response, we had to prepare all of our electronics for measuring the um, air gun signals, we had a whole suite of sound recorders set around to measure all the signals that the fish received accurately. With government approvals pending, planning for the seismic survey had its own challenges. The Scott Reef Lagoon was proving very small and shallow for the large survey vessel to manoeuvre, trailing streamers four kilometres long. Woodside also committed to implementing exclusion zones where turtles were thought to be hatching, and by chance an unusually high number of Indonesian fishing boats turned up for their annual collection of shellfish and sea cucumbers. At the same time, the scientific team embarked on a five-day plan to collect and test more than 1,200 fish and establish whether coral reef fish could be impacted by seismic sound. One of the, the things that we did was that we set up what we called RUVs or, or remote underwater videos where essentially pointed them towards side attached fish um, and what we wanted to do was actually see what their behavioural response to the approaching seismic vessel was. As the uh, vessel approached the, the fish reacted, they basically, could, you could see that they reacted to the sound where they actually scurried into the, the reef and as the vessel passed over and the sound got further and further away, the fish rose out of the coral reef habitat again and basically went around about their normal activity. On the scientific boats above, pathologists found no other damage to fish tissue or organs. Meanwhile, leading researchers from Pennsylvania State University, led by Marty Hastings, were putting their world-first fish hearing technique to the test. We built a special tube, uh, which was vibration and acoustically isolated, which we used on the back deck of the vessel. The fish would be anaesthetised and these tiny little electrodes, one put in just above the brain stem and one just on the body as an earth. And then we present sounds to the fish in a standard fashion, they were tones, and the brain activity would be monitored. The fish that had been tested in these purpose-built chambers showed no hearing loss. Interestingly, we discovered that the auditory systems don't seem to have been damaged. We didn't see damage in the Scott Reef fish, even though the, a larger air gun array passed at quite a close range. More testing was done weeks later in laboratories at Curtin University to ensure no late onset hearing damage had occurred. On the whole, the fish are still there and they're still doing what they were doing before the seismic survey took place. In addition, three large surveys of coral and reef fish populations in the wild were conducted by the Commonwealth Government's Australian Institute of Marine Science one prior to the seismic activity, one directly after, and another three months down the track. They established that fish populations had not declined at Scott Reef and that coral assemblages showed no signs of damage as a result of the seismic survey. We found no effect whatsoever of the seismic activity. In fact, it turned out that we had more breakage appearing in the control area. I was looking hard for 
signs of sublethal response, um, oozing mucus, polyps which were moribund, particularly uh, you know some months after the um, seismic activity within the lagoon. Uh, but there was no sign, even immediately after the seismic run, and we were we had our ship following the tail of the seismic vessel. So we were filming in real time just as the swath went through and there was just no evidence whatsoever of any sublethal or lethal effect. Woodside Energy and its Browse joint venture partners can now claim a world first. They have successfully demonstrated that seismic surveys can be done in sensitive coral reef environments with no detrimental impact. Results that have shown no major changes in fish behaviour no damage to any coral assemblages, no impacts on fish hearing, even for the most sensitive species, and no long-term impact on fish populations or the coral reef itself. There's no doubt about it. This is a benchmarking, significant uh, series of experiments, and that's what they are, because it was all well designed and controlled that will be of enormous value internationally. There's no doubt in my mind because Woodside absolutely is well at the very top of its commitment to understanding properly um, the environmental regime that it's working within. We have, by anyone's um, opinion, a very sensitive habitat that we're trying to manage a gas development around. And we're acutely aware as we, we move forward towards a development is that we've got to manage that both for our company's reputation but just because we're really concerned about making this a sort of sustainable development where we can be proud of how we've actually managed the environment. 